I want to talk a little bit about uh, our experience with Corporate Accountability International over the last 30 years um, in the str and the strategies that we've used to push changes in, in transnational corporations. What we're, what we're working with our members and with activists to do is to change the cost-benefit ratio for corporations to engage in abuses. Um, and so that's really, you know, we're looking at, at these corporations as economic entities and needing to, uh, put, needing to send our message to them in terms that they're going to understand, which is, which is financial. And that for us has broken down into two broad strategies over the years. One is really corporate images are among their most valuable assets, and particularly corporations that have a consumer profile. Uh, and so our campaigns have, large, have um, worked toward exposing the reality behind those corporate images and really um, affecting their value then in the short term and in the long term. And so during our nuclear weapon makers campaign and the boycott of GE over their leading role in producing and promoting nuclear weapons, uh, one tactic that we used was the production of a documentary film, Deadly Deception. The film won the Academy Award for Best Documentary Short in 1991. Within six months after that, they announced they were moving out of the remainder of their nuclear weapons business. Uh, and then another, uh, our current campaign actually focuses on the water industry. And um, one, of our, one of our new tactics is the Think Outside the Bottle campaign. Um, so we are targeting the water bottlers, Coke, Pepsi, and Nestle. Um, we've been having to get a dig in here about the bottled water here at the, at the conference. Um, but really, the bottled water is a, a really important entry point for addressing issues around the global water crisis with people, particularly in the U.S. It's a way that the water industry is positioning water as a high-priced luxury. Um, rather than a human right, and so we've we've taken on um, the images of these these water bottlers um, and the you know and the lies that they're selling us. Um, the reality that bottled water is no safer than tap water, and sometimes even less safe. Um, the fact that a family of three drinking only bottled water for 18 years uh, would actually spend on that purchase more than the cost of a four-year education at a public university. So it's a huge waste of money, resources, is looking at ways that we can create conditions inside these corporations that make change possible. So these corporations are you know, hundreds, thousands of times the size of our organizations. And um, you know, even segments of them dwarf us in, in size. And so we really have to be creative about how we can find levers of pressure. And uh, the Nuclear Weapon Makers Campaign GE Boycott is another good case in point here where it, during the final phases of that campaign, we also looked at GE's medical division, which was uh, about a $3 billion division in a $50 billion overall company, an important growth segment for the corporation. Um, and also presented a, a huge contradiction between life-saving medical equipment on the one hand and deadly radiation and toxic waste from nuclear weapons on the other. Very motivating to the faith communities that were involved in the campaign, to uh, public health and medical professionals. And, um, and also an area where a single purchase of a CAT scan or an MRI unit is, you know, couple million dollars. Um, so it can add up pretty rapidly to sales losses. But sales losses aren't even the biggest part of changing a cost-benefit ratio. In this case, it was top management time that this, that this corporation was spending. I mean, you think about what, you know, Jack Welch, the CEO of GE, was making at that time, that he was flying around the country to meet with nuns to try to talk them into buying GE medical equipment. Uh, and, and that the company was spending those resources for their, you know, for their senior vice president in that area too, and having to train their whole sales force. You know, so we got these briefing books that they would use for the sales forces, and it had you know, why our CAT scanner is better, with the features that it has, and then the tab on nuclear weapons, and their talking points on how to talk about nuclear weapons. So th those are 
um, a couple of the major strategies, and, and you know, we're always, as a membership organization, looking for ways that we can mobilize lots of people in these campaigns because um, it because we we're, we know we're going to need millions of people, billions of people, ultimately, to really shift the global balance of, of power. Um, and so what our overall strategy and approach has been is to open the door, really, with, with specific campaigns, with actions that people can take that will make a difference in their own day-to-day -day lives and in the lives of other people, um, and that also help us then to start having the conversations about the bigger issues around corporate power and, and control. The other the other then part of our approach is working in the international policy arena, working towards democratically accountable global institutions um, that can really serve as a counterweight to transnational corporations. You know, this is very long term in, in nature, but um, looking at really, we're, we're dealing with global corporations that have surpassed the nation state and their size and, and wealth, and we need checks and balances that are global too. Um, and also, these policy shifts at, at that level help to lock in the changes that, we, that are secured through people's movements um, and help to secure compliance with the, with the changes that, that people really push to happen through, the, through um, affecting the, the cost-benefit ratio. So for Corporate Accountability International, uh, you know, we've worked a lot in the health arena, our first campaign on Nestle and infant formula marketing uh, contributed to the adoption of the World Health Organization Code of Marketing on Breast Milk Substitutes, which was really the first time that the World Health Organization took on a commercial product and, um, and set, set standards at the global level for how that would be dealt with. Uh, but it was a code, and so when the WHO looked to take on the tobacco issue, it for the first time used its treaty-making authority. And that means that what we have in the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, which was negotiated between 1999 and, and 2003 under the auspices of WHO, is the, is the first global health and corporate accountability treaty with really important measures in it, both to reverse the global tobacco epidemic and also to set really important precedents for holding other industries accountable when they harm people in our environment. Um, so we're looking to leverage those changes as we approach the water issue. Um, and allies around the world have already started calling for a global treaty that will protect people's right and access to water and also prevent corporate control of water. And when we look at the, the political steps that are going to have to happen to make that possible, really dealing with the, the role of the international financial institutions, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund in favoring privatization of our water services is going to be a, an important stepping stone toward uh, controls on the global level on that issue and the political influence that they wield. And fundamentally that's something that as we look at how, do, how are we going to subordinate corporations and you know what are the functions that they're performing in our society that they shouldn't be performing. Well they shouldn't be our, they shouldn't be displacing our governments and so um, in the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, actually, there's a, a, a imp really important provision that obligates the countries that ratify the treaty to protect their health policies from commercial and other vested interests of the tobacco industry. So it's a real expansion of the notion of conflict of interest at the international legal level and, and what the obligations are of countries to, to deal with those issues. And, uh, the, this treaty has now been ratified by over 145 countries, unfortunately not the U.S., um, not surprisingly. 80% um, of the world's people live in countries that have ratified. And so that is, really, you know, if we think about conflicts of interest, well, what if, you know, our energy policy were protected from interference by oil companies, for example? What if policy on toxics? were protected from interference by the chemical industry. Um, now, the, the corporations that we take on are really scared of these kinds of precedents. Um, 
And you know, we, we know that because within WHO, when, when they started to look at how to deal with food and nutrition issues, and um, people raised questions about conflicts of interest by the food industry with health policy, uh, the response from the then Director General, Gro Harlem Brundtland, well, was food is not tobacco. Um, it, unfortunately, at, at the time was not true. A lot of the junk food marketers, in fact, one of the big junk food marketers was Kraft, which was at the time part of Philip Morris Altria. Um, and Dr. Brundtland, unfortunately, has left the WHO and is now on the Global Health Advisory Board at Pepsi. 